the most important question we need to answer as, as a generation is, can we solve this? There is just so much acceleration across every sector and industry. The Inflation Reduction Act passed in the United States and everybody in the US just had to figure out how to do things differently and at a different scale for clean energy. What keeps you hopeful? There are inspirational people around almost every corner. You get to meet and talk to an HVAC installer who's like shifted their whole business away from oil to heat pumps, and they've done it within a year-long period. Hello, and welcome to Conversations on Climate, hosted from the prestigious Yale School of Management amidst the vibrant Clean Energy Conference. I had the distinct pleasure of speaking with Stuart DeCrew, the executive director of CBE, who plays a pivotal role in shaping the School of Management and the School of the Environment as strategic initiatives, research education programs, and community outreach in the areas of business and environmental sustainability. Stuart shares his fascinating perspectives on the interconnectedness of academia, policy, business, and community, and how Yale and Yale's sustainability incubator, Climate Haven, sits within that business ecosystem. He also offers us a glimpse of the optimism and solutions emerging in the face of the climate crisis. This conversation is full of insight, making it one that you won't want to miss. Stuart, thanks so much for taking the time out of this uh, fantastic conference that you've been instrumental for organizing. How many people do we have here today? Uh, well, over the course of the two days, we've had almost 700 people register. Wow. So, you know, between different sessions and areas, you'll see Zhang Auditorium packed, and that's about 380 people. And we've got overflow rooms in case people, you know, need a seat outside. So it really shows the kind of community of policymakers, like corporates, early stage companies, the venture capitalists, the other folks who are all in this area, um, and community members who just care about this. So it's been, uh, it's been great. The Yale alumni community um, has been deeply engaged and involved in this for a real long period at a time um, and to see them come out is uh, is really cool um, because they're they're a very fun engaging creative bunch to hang out with and they always like come back with something new to share with the institution that hopefully makes us a little bit better fantastic yeah, yeah. No, I found that so my, my own experience here it's uh, it's been, been relatively short only only a couple of years now but I Every time I bump into some you know, Yale alumni, you end up walking away feeling a little bit smarter. You've learned something. You know? Right, it's, right. It's well, you good. know, it goes to the engagement you have mm -hmm. with it. And I think that's where, like, you know, you and other folks who show up and participate in this stuff, the kind of deep curiosity and engagement that you bring is what feeds the institution. So, like, within the short period of time that you've been here, you've already had many deep engagements, met a lot of amazing people, like, you know, had the opportunity to interview and engage with somebody like Zoe Chance, who's just got, like, so many wildly interesting things to share with the world that could be applied across sectors. Um, and, you know, kudos to you for being able to just spend the time here. Like, this place is as good as the people who come here make it. So, Fantastic. thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, tell me, um, what is your climate story of 2023? My climate story of 2023? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, for, on a, on a community level, I think the climate story of 2023 in New Haven, which is a place that we love and deeply enjoy, and then in Connecticut, um, which is a state that kind of has the ability to make one call and find a regulator or somebody in finance or somebody in policy or in a corporate that can help or engage with you, is the creation of a new climate tech incubator that we've all worked on in the region called Climate Haven. Um, and this is something that like, you know, a ragtag group of volunteers volunteers from across these sectors like came up with and were our own kind of like third place startup like outside of academia outside of corporate outside of policy like where do we provide the support to do something that is incredibly hard building and scaling a climate tech company and make that slightly easier for those folks and just use all the resources that we have in and around this area to help support them. And so to see that launch and get off the ground, to see Ryan Dings hired as the president, to see a board built, which I'm really happy to sit on with a lot of other people from around the area, to see it be embedded and engaged in a way where it's here to benefit the community um, itself and no one institution is sort of saying this is ours. Um, and then to see like you know the target of we were gonna have six startups that were supposed to be in there by this time and we got 17 and there's an accelerator that's starting up early next year and a range of partners that are in and around it and you know we went to the event last night and you just feel a huge vibe and energy of community in a place where it's palpable 
and it's real and you get into a space and you can just feel the noise and feel the kind of like the kind of burgeoning creativity and generosity that's in and around the place for like we want you to succeed because our future is contingent on it um, and that's awesome for us here but then you know on a on a broader level I mean I think that the the stories that we look at are like there is just so much acceleration across every sector and industry. And there's speed bumps in certain ones, like we've seen recently um, in offshore wind um, on the northeastern coast of the United States. But still, the projections and the resources there and the kind of like people who are thinking about it creatively and optimistically and in an engaged way through conversations between regulators and utilities are sorting that out. And they're going to keep sorting it out. And, um, you know, we just have seen so much activity, particularly in the U.S., on the kind of application and work of everything related to the Inflation Reduction Act that has accelerated and sped up progress in ways where it's like, you know, in March of 2020, we all had to figure out how to work in a different way. And it's like the Inflation Reduction Act passed in the United States and everybody in the U.S. just had to figure out how to do things differently and at a different scale for clean energy. And that, um, that supercharge element, that kind of turbocharge of the economy is not going away. I mean, I look at it and I hope like when I say this and I look back, it's absolutely true that like we're at the, right at the beginning of the greatest industrial transformation since the New Deal in the United States. And you just get to see whole industries and areas and communities be reshaped. Um, and investment in places that have been underinvested in, and people who get to live in cleaner, healthier communities with less energy burden. And that is what I hope happens. Okay. Yeah. So you're, you're very positive about the impact of the uh, Inflation Reduction yeah. Act. Yeah. Yeah. I spent this morning uh, talking to uh, the Connecticut Green Bank mm -hmm. and the whole idea of of how this, like the founder Green Bank, has been scaling and leveraging and uh, and creating like lots of other green banks mm -hmm. all, all all over. Um, would you have an idea of how you know your own institution Yale can be scaling its own impact? You know, we think. I mean, one of the ways we think about it is really the through the program you participated in, in financing and deploying clean energy or the online certificate programs that we have. Um, you know, we have a, a mission and an obligation as a nonprofit institution that should be a public good to say, where are we unlocking all of the knowledge and the, the curriculum, the research, the resources here so that it can be applied? And the lag times that we have at times between when a peer-reviewed paper would be understood, adopted, or put into place by people out there in the world who are doing the work is, is long, it's incredibly critical work, absolutely necessary, but there's other ways that universities have to support that. And we think that if we are doing the right thing for a 55-year-old or a 45-year-old or a 35-year-old who can take the education that we're able to provide and use it tomorrow, um, and we can do that for multiples of people beyond what we're able to do for graduate students here, that the working professionals who are out there actually making these changes are the way that we can measure, understand, and consider our impact. And if we've given somebody the ability to do a sensitivity analysis in a better way that changes the kind of solar investment they made or a policy tool that then they offer to their you know, regional state regulator that they can be implemented, like that's the way that we see this kind of happening and scaling. And it's also the kind of convenings that we have here where you know, the 300 year old brand has a lot of carried interest to it. Like <laughs> there's a lot of intellectual capital stored up here that people want to come back to. Um, and we can create an environment where great serendipity and happy, happy accidents can happen between incredibly bright and compassionate people. And that's where I think you, know, you see events like this where all these people show up. Um, and if we're doing our job well, we're creating a space where they feel completely free and engaged to kind of share ideas and then do something with what they've learned on Friday on Monday. It is, it is a great community. Like, you know, there, there's a lot, a lot of very talented people, very, very smart people in here, and the more I meet, the more, more impressed I am. Um, but I ask you, what, what are you most impressed about if, from the cohorts of people who decide to take this program? The, the people that come through are why you stay and keep working in these jobs. Um, because, you know, as as the world begins to understand the kind of moral imperative and economic opportunity and social good all are all overlapping on these issues, you've seen generations of people come through who've kind of always had that compass. 
and they've been doing it potentially, you know, 30 years ago or 25 years ago or 20 years ago when it was lonelier. Um, and they just had to be persistent and gritty and independent. And now when you can see them stacking up together and feeling that kind of greater collective strength, like that's just when you, you know, you get to see those individual parts of expertise, those puzzle pieces and the kind of recognition amongst a community that like there are deep experts in one area that need to connect to your expertise and they're a puzzle piece that has to fit to yours. And if I don't understand where the deployment mechanisms are here and if I don't understand where the financing mechanisms are here or the changes that we can make in policy fit together and have somebody who can really explain that to me on an interpersonal level, um, we're not going to get these things done as quickly or at scale that we need. The, the wealth of relationships that we have here is actually one of the greatest resources that we have to unlock. And I feel like the people who come through here have a, a sense and an understanding of how powerful that is. Like that's a source of wealth, both generationally that we have to deploy immediately, right? Like, and um, yeah, and so those humans, you know, like the Brian Garcias and the Sarah Hararis that you just see, they're like generations apart, but like deeply aligned, both kind of intellectually, morally, philosophically, and have entirely different skill sets that mm -hmm. then combine to make the Green Bank a more active, engaged place. Fantastic. Yeah, I think that's one thing that I've, I've been massively impressed at here is, is the, all of the, the interconnections that are, that, that are found. Like, yeah. you know, we're talking about the importance of, uh, of policy. People don't talk enough about the importance of policy. The importance of technology, um, how, how financing all fits together, how you, how you layer all of this, the, the interlinkages. You, it's something you do, you do extremely well. Um, if there's kind of one last question, though, if I could, mm -hmm. I, I could, I could ask you. We are, um, the whole climate sustainability agenda is, uh, like it's, it's found, founded upon an existential crisis. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's founded upon, upon the, but the most important question we need to answer as, as a generation is, can we solve this? If we can't solve this, not, not a lot else matters. Um, given the, the gravity of, of that, um, what keeps you hopeful? Yeah, um, I mean, the well, one thing is the just the the how incredible we are as a as a unit of building things and how helpful we can be on an individual basis um, when kind of one individual asks for the help of another, right? You sort of get to see on a individual level where if like I'm walking down the street and asking for directions like you're gonna stop and help me and that like, if you can sit with the kind of like quick reaction that we have and that we all have to kind of immediately help and support, um, you think about then scaling that up through the systems that are complex and we get lost in a lot of terminology and other things, but the, the human element and impact of I am here to help and support and connect with that other individual is certainly the thing that I, you, you know, you lean on when you just look back and you look at the trend lines or the science that's telling you that things are going you know, off into, into directions where none of us want to go. Um, I think the, the thing that ultimately like, will, you know, keeps me hopeful um, is that the, there are inspirational people around almost every corner. Um, of the institutions that are here, but then the places that are out there. And like, you know, you get to meet and talk to an HVAC installer who's like shifted their whole business away from oil to heat pumps, and they've done it within a year long period. And like, that's a lot of change for somebody. And like, they've gone through that rapidly. And you just know the kind of technical expertise and willpower and how that's had to be reshaped. And like, all of those stories collectively add up to something. And you know, and at a macro level, like, the Inflation Reduction Act and elements like it and the kind of, I think, stepping up of support around the world is like, policy has gotten its act together in a certain respect, right? Like, it's not there completely, but we're ratcheting it up. And when you look at something like that, then you get to say, okay, the advocates did their job, the science have been telling us forever on this, the policymakers have stepped up, and now it's the unit of people who love implementation and problem solving and experimentation that now have to go. And like, we're good at that. Like, once we sort out the problems associated with all these complex systems that are there, like, once we have directionally what that North Star is, like, we can move. So. Um, 
just got to keep turning the compass toward that mm -hmm. um, north um, and have people who are willing to kind of continue to challenge the system and adjust it back that way. Um, but you have no other choice but to be optimistic. I love this planet. I love this place. I love the people that are around me. Like, we got to go. Right. Thank you so much. What yep. a f fantastic way to finish that. Cool. Okay. Great. All right. <laughs>